I am a former civil rights lawyer, and I am a teacher. I've taught at, I'm currently teaching at Community College of Aurora History, and I have taught at Metro State and at CU Denver. In fact, just graduated with my master's in history from CU Denver this May. Um, and thank you for helping us to commemorate Constitution Day. It was on this day in 1787, uh, very hot and dusty Philadelphia, that the delegates to the Constitutional Convention signed, those who remained, signed the uh, Constitution that would be ratified in the next year. Today it looks like we're going to focus on the um, uh, religion clauses in the First Amendment. We're going to have four speakers and I'll introduce them at, as, they give their, uh, as they give their presentations. Up first, we have a hometown woman from Metro State University. We have Professor Shelby Ballack, uh, who is going to be talking on religious liberty and Christian duty. What did the founders envision? Professor Ballack is an assistant professor at Metro. She specializes in early American religious history and has written, quote, equal right and equal privilege, separating church and state in Vermont, and actually has an upcoming book Rally the Scattered Believers, Northern New England's Religious Geography. Professor Ballack, come on up. Good afternoon. Just like that. Um, so what I'd like to do today is give us a little historical background. Uh, that, that's what I do best. Um, on the relationship between church and state. It really remains a very live issue today. And much of the debate swirls around the question of whether the founding generation intended this nation to be a Christian nation. So what I'd like to do is take a stab at answering that question. In Europe and throughout most of colonial America, established churches had been the rule up through the early modern period, not the exception. There are many different meanings of establishment, but generally speaking, it means that the state somehow supported a particular church. Uh, that could be through laws that privileged the church, it could be through funding, public funding, taxation that privileged the church. In Europe, establishment usually involved a single state religion, and it enjoyed a of privileges. In the most extreme case, there could be a formal creed that everybody in the nation had to accept, at least on paper, um, and it was established through state power or the established church might even be the only legal church. But it could also mean that the established church was just one that was entitled to tax support, tax revenues. Maybe there was a required church attendance. Uh, it could be that the followers of that church had certain political privileges, like they were the only ones who were allowed to vote or hold office or so, and so forth. Establishment could coexist with an official policy of religious toleration. Uh, it was certainly the case, say, for example, in England, Great Britain, um, and the American colonies, that dissenters could generally worship as they pleased for the most part, um, but they didn't benefit from the privileges that the members of the established church were entitled to. So, as I said, that was really the circumstance that we're dealing with in colonial North America. Now, in colonial North America, establishment tended not to be terribly extreme. The English Toleration Act of 1689 applied throughout the English Empire. And it enforced toleration for most Protestants, but it also allowed the continued establishment of the Anglican Church. So you could worship however you please, but your taxes might support the Church of England. The way it worked on the ground in the colonies varied, and a lot of that had to do with the different religious um, constituencies in each colony. A lot of that had to do with the fact that nobody from, there was no bishop from the Church of England keeping an eye on things in the colonies, so things took uh, separate, sh different shapes. Um, some colonies did establish the Anglican Church and also extended religious uh, toleration toward dissenters. That was the case in colonies like Virginia, South Carolina, and Maryland. Others had what we call multiple establishments, which basically means that the towns established the churches, the colony didn't technically establish the churches. And so you'd have different churches established in different places. That was the system throughout most of New England. Uh, governments like Massachusetts and Connecticut and New Hampshire required each town to support a minister. 
technically it could have been a minister of any denomination, the understanding was that it would be the minister of the Congregationalist Church, which was the majority throughout the region. And that's how it generally worked. Now the Anglican Church was still established by British law, um, not just in the but not in the indi individual towns, and so the actual situation on the ground tended to fly under the radar of the empire. So a place like Massachusetts could use the system of multiple establishment to avoid calling attention to a situation that Great Britain might want to, would have wanted to go in and change. So establishment was the rule of the day in the 1600s and the 1700s. And part of it was political. The churches supported the state. They helped strengthen the government's authority by encouraging public morality. But there was more to it than that. People believed that if you didn't have the state supporting churches, um, then people wouldn't go to church. They wouldn't join churches, they wouldn't give money to churches, uh, and ministers' uh, uh, authority would weaken, and the whole backbone of a pious and moral society would start to collapse. So if the state removed that support, if it didn't require people to attend on the Sabbath, if it didn't require people to allow their tax money to support <coughs> ministers and churches, um, if it didn't require them to support a particular creed, then people feared that the whole basis for organized religion would just melt away. And it would leave the society with no moral foundation. Now remember, that sort of thing had not been tried before. So, really, it was about more than religious liberty. When it came to establishment, the big question that the founders asked was, how much did the state trust people to be moral, law-abiding citizens all on their own without the churches compelling them to do so? Well, here's what I'm going to argue about what early Americans thought about the relationship between church and state. Um, the founding generation, the revolutionary generation, the generation of which members signed the Constitution, settled on the idea of a secular government, a wholly secular government, but assumed that the nation would have a Christian culture. But that Christian culture would be voluntary. It would not be subject to law. And so you can start to see what I mean if you look at establishment on the state and federal level separately. The first governments that dealt with the question of religious liberty in an independent United States were the state governments, not the national government. As soon as it became clear in 1776 that the nation was actually fighting for independence as opposed to greater rights within the empire, which is what they had been fighting for before, um, the Continental Congress instructed the state assemblies to start writing constitutions. Um, and so what we see in the, say, 1776, 77, 78, is this flurry of constitution writing all up and down the Atlantic coast. And most states drafted constitutions pretty quickly, and then they kept redrafting them and redrafting them once they figured out that what they were doing wasn't working. And so there was a lot of talk about constitutional liberties and constitutional rights and constitutional government. Now all of these constitutions dealt in some way with freedom of religion, and they approached religious liberty in ways that were complicated. Uh, freedom of religion tended to come by degrees and imperfectly, and that was because most Americans didn't know how to have a state without state-supported religion. Almost all Americans agreed that people should have the right to worship as they pleased, and that was really never an issue except for certain religious groups that were considered you know, particularly offensive like Catholics. Um, almost all Americans agreed that people should have the right to worship, but they were still unsure about dismantling the state support for religion. So states handled the question of establishment differently, and it might help to take a look at two instructive cases. Uh, one is Virginia and the other one is Massachusetts, both of which had some of the strongest establishments in the colonial era. Virginia had long established the Church of England. It was one of the strongest Anglican establishments in all of the American colonies. Um, and it ultimately made a clean and complete break with that establishment. And that break was the result of an unlikely alliance between Enlightenment rationalists, so we're talking about deists, and other people who tended to adopt Enlightenment uh, approaches to toleration and evangelical Protestants. Now, deists and evangelical Protestants didn't get together on much, but they got together on this, and here's why. The earliest state constitution in 1776 left open, but did not specifically require, the possibility of religious taxation. 
And then that sort of was this was was the status. And then in 1779, two separate bills came up for a, a vote. One was Thomas Jefferson's. And it would have made all religious participation completely voluntary, all religious contributions completely voluntary, period, end of discussion. Another bill was sponsored by Patrick Henry. He proposed that all state or that the state must encourage religious uh, participation in order to support the public order, which had really been the majority view before that. And so the bill would have required each person to designate his religious taxes to the church of his choice. Now at that point, evangelicals allied with Jefferson to unleash a campaign against any and all religious toleration whatsoever. The evangelicals argued that only God can make people into believers, that the state should not be involved with the churches, period, in any circumstance. They argued that religious taxation should not support the public order because required payments really had nothing to do with whether a person was really religious. There was a stalemate on this question for five years um, and ultimately, the coalition behind Patrick Henry's proposal fell apart. And so then, Madison, James Madison and Thomas Jefferson teamed up to push Jefferson's bill through in 1786. The bill became the Virginia Act for Establishing Religious Freedom. And it asserted that true religion could only happen if true liberty of conscience prevailed. And that religious coercion could only beget religious hypocrisy. Accordingly, the government could play no role whatsoever in regulating religious belief or behavior. This was the most comprehensive and unconditional statement for religious liberty up to that point, and it came from the state that had had one of the most stringent establishments. Now, Massachusetts had just as strict an establishment of congregationalism, though, not of the Anglican Church, but its road to religious liberty was much more complicated. In Massachusetts Constitution of 1780, which was its second main draft, um, there were two articles that specifically addressed religious liberty. The first was Article 2, and Article 2 refer, uh, affirmed the, quote, right and duty, unquote, of all to worship God as their conscience dictated. Um, but because the article included the word duty, not just right, it implied that people did not have a choice not to worship. The ambiguous language would cause a lot of problems with the state's dissenters. And then, so that was Article 2. Article 3 then required towns to choose a minister that would receive public support. And so that was basically along the lines of the multiple establishment that had existed since early in the colonial period. What that meant was that the Congregationalists established in Massachusetts had more or less survived. Dissenters could file certificates. They could have their taxes directed toward a minister of their own choosing, but these laws were not as generous as they seemed at first glance. If you had no church of your own sect nearby, if you were a Baptist and there was no Baptist church in your town, then you could be out of luck. If you were a Baptist but had not made a full conversion and were not, if you were not a Baptist in full communion, then somebody could decide you weren't really a Baptist. If the town clerk just didn't like you, you could be out of luck. I've read cases where that happened. Um, and so the law was not really all that welcoming to dissenters. And the default was to direct everybody's taxes to their own minister. You couldn't just assume that because you were a Baptist, the problem was solved. So the Massachusetts establishment proved very difficult to dismantle. Ultimately, it ended in 1833 when Massachusetts became the last state to end religious taxation. Now, in between Virginia and Massachusetts, there were a lot of different approaches to religious establishment. As of the late 1780s, all states provided for religious liberty, liberty of conscience, um, but in ways that were usually compatible with some state religion. Uh, test acts allowed only Christians or Protestants or believers in God or Trinitarians or whatever it was in the individual state to vote or to run for office. There could also be other kinds of uh, preferences for a general Protestant establishment like mandatory church attendance. But frankly, Americans tended not to cry foul over those kinds of support, even the ones who were absolutely vehemently against religious taxation. And here's why. At the time, most Americans were pretty comfortable with a general state support for Protestantism. Even most evangelicals who were definitely on the leading edge of the fight against religious taxation did not argue that non-Christians should be protected. Um, Baptists were the exception to that rule. They argued that everybody should be protected. 
uh, and they assumed a relationship between Protestant Christianity and American culture defined in a very broad way. So that's how states handle the issue of religious freedom. But what about the federal government? The federal government, frankly, just didn't deal with it uh, until after the Constitution was ratified. The original Constitution barely touched the question of religion at all. Um, and that had to do mainly with the fact that the Americans were fighting a war for independence and religious freedom just didn't seem to be at the forefront of their concerns. Now, there's a lot of misunderstanding about who the framers were what their religious backgrounds were and what their religious inclinations were. And so I'd like to spend a few minutes clarifying that. You hear some people claiming that the framers were all deists, non-Christian theists who had this sort of enlightenment and rationalist approach to religion. You hear some people who claim they were all evangelical Christians who purposely designed a constitution in the Judeo-Christian tradition. Well, neither of those claims is true, and frankly, the term Judeo-Christian was not one that late 18th century Americans would have recognized because they did not see themselves as sharing a heritage with Jews. Judeo-Christian is a 20th century concept, so it's not even worth it to, to discuss that. The delegates to the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia were generally part of the religious majority of whatever states they came from. So there were a lot of Presbyterians, a lot of Episcopalians, this is what we call Anglicans after the Revolution. There were a lot of Congregationalists. Um, they were frankly very mainline and mainstream. There was really only one evangelical, truly evangelical delegate that was a Methodist from Delaware. Uh, but he was really the only one. Uh, religious affiliation partly correlated with delegate social standing, and at the time, evangelicals tended to be poor, and the delegates in the Constitutional Convention tended to be wealthy. So they didn't really overlap. Now, a few of the delegates were deists. Edmund Randolph of Virginia was, Benjamin Franklin was. Um, some people think that George Washington may have adopted deism by that time, but there's no hard evidence really of any firm conviction on his part. By and large, though, the framers' religion tended to be moderate and mainline. They were inclined toward Enlightenment rationalism. No denomination had a majority in the delegation. And the convention as a whole tended to have an ethos of moderation and compromise. So the delegates sought to sol solutions to practical problems. They really didn't seek solutions to religious problems. There was no national church anyway to talk about. And so it was simple enough to set aside religious concerns to really focus on the problems that the delegates were there to, to solve. Now, the convention was quite secular in its overall approach. As far as we know, there were never any opening prayers. There was never any regular invocation of religion. Religion only came up twice that we know of, and admittedly, the records are very fragmentary. Um, at one point, the delegates decided to allow people to take an affirmation instead of an oath, because for some people, like Quakers, taking an oath was against their faith, because it, uh, taking an oath was really something you could only do to, you know, for God. Um, in another case, they decided that there would be no religious test for national office. But that was really it, and that was the end of the story until the First Amendment. The First Amendment came a couple years later, um, and it too contains no explicit endorsement of Christianity. The final wording, which restricted Congress from passing any law to establish religion or restrict religious expression, reflected an 18th century understanding of establishment, which most people understood to mean exclusive state preference for one religion. The amendment only applied to federal law after the Civil War when the 14th Amendment was ratified. And I don't want to get too far down that road, but the 14th Amendment contains something called the Equal Protection Clause. And what that meant is that any federal law that applies in one place must apply equally every place else. Um, and so that's when a lot of these you know, civil liberties that are enshrined in the Constitution actually applied on the state level and state law. But at the time, the Constitution did not invalidate any state establishment that existed, and there were many. So when you consider the states and you consider the federal government together, um, by 1791, the foundations of the nation's religious order, at least for the time being, were pretty much set. There would be religious freedom. Religious affiliation would be voluntary. On a national level, there would be separation of church and state, and on the state level, well, states were going to decide whatever they were going to decide. There was a common religion.
religious culture that pervaded the nation, despite pluralism, despite fragmentation, despite the fact that some denominations, frankly, could not stand each other. Um, and that culture had two layers, and they supported each other, and they appeared to be extensions of each other. Together, these two layers of American religious culture were born from the sense that the national mission that emerged from the Revolutionary War promoted liberty in, in all forms. And I realize that we can do that too. Um, but the first of these layers is what we call civil religion. It's an abstract concept, but at its heart, it refers to the nation's vocation, um, which was a counterpart to an individual's spiritual vocation or calling to God. So in a sense, it, it, it refers to a nation's divine calling. The idea that Americans were living in a new English Israel was not a new one, and those of you who were in my colonial class this morning know all about that. Um, that idea dated back to the Puritans. But after the American Revolution, Americans connected that kind of providentialism, that kind of sense of destiny, to a more or less common understanding of their national mission. The founding generation believed that the United States had come into being as part of some grand plan that God intended to use the new nation to set an example for liberty, for independence, for other nations to follow. Now, it was not a denominational faith. It was not even a chauvinistic American one in the sense that as the founders understood it, they should share their own nation's blessings with the rest of the world. So it was less that they saw the United States as exclusively favored than they saw the new nation as sort of first among equals throughout the, throughout the world. Now, some people did take this idea to extremes, interpreting the U.S.'s providential role in ways that fostered this kind of patriotic self-righteousness. But in the early republic, that sense of national destiny and divine favor was tempered by an almost universal understanding of divine judgment. And so the idea was maybe God favored the United States, but also God could carry out divine retribution against the United States, so you better watch out. Um, if people stray too far from the national mission, they could be in deep trouble. Uh, so God's blessings were conditional on the Americans' ability to stick with that divine plan, whatever it was. Now, different Americans disagree on exactly the nature of that plan um, but and how Americans were supposed to follow it. But a widely accepted understanding of national mission, whatever the mission was, really made up the core idea of civil religion during the early republic. So that was the first layer. The second layer is what we can call church religion. And if civil religion was a kind of public religion tied up in national destiny, available to all through rationalism and region, reason, then church religion was more private, it was connected more to personal salvation rather than national salvation. So whereas civil religion united the nation in a common relationship with God, church religion united the individual directly to God and gave the individual a personal sense of mission to integrate with the national so when I say that church religion was the other side of the coin that civil religion was on, I'm talking about this widespread, mostly Protestant religious culture that found expression in different denominations, emphasized individual salvation, emphasized God's ability to rescue individuals from sin, just like God could rescue the nation. Now, church religion existed almost independently from civil religion, and it had long existed in North America. But it's worth considering in this case, because both of these understandings of national and individual destiny fell within a broad understanding of God's power to intervene and save. Both were mutually supportive. Both depended upon the kind of liberty that became an article of faith in the founding period. Church religion and civil religion operated under a broad understanding of national mission, which was grounded in the idea the United States is a promised land that enjoyed a special divine covenant, much like the covenant that an individual has when one is saved, according to a lot of these faiths. Okay, so what does any of this have to do with religious liberty and the question of whether the founders envisioned the United States as a Christian nation? Well, as I argued before, the founders assumed a nation with a Christian soul, but they explicitly declined to enshrine Christianity in law. In that sense, they made religion entirely voluntary. Voluntary religion, I think, is the most important legacy of the process of disestablishment. 
Regardless of establishment traditions, Americans were left entirely to their own decision when it came to matters of faith. Voluntary religion became part of the nation's spiritual character heading into the 19th century. And it laid the foundation for an explosion of faiths and denominations and religious sensibilities that would come just a few years after the Constitution was ratified. So freedom of religion, you could argue, made the country more religious as opposed to what most people feared, which is that it would make it less so. But the only role the government played in that process was to stay completely out of it. Thank you. Malik, I was taking a lot of notes. <laughs> oh, I forgot to mention this earlier on. We're going to have three other presentations, and then we will have a question and answer period. <laughs> okay? So, there we go. All right. Up next, we have Nathan Woodliffe Stanley. And uh, Mr. Woodliffe Stanley is going to be addressing church and state today. Um, Nathan is an ordained ordained Unitarian and Universalist minister who serves as the executive director of the Colorado, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Colorado American Civil Liberties Union. And he also serves on the board of the Interfaith Alliance of Colorado. Previously, he was director of the Mississippi Center of Nonprofits. Nathan Woodliffe Stanley. Very glad to be here and glad that you're here on Constitution Day, uh, thinking about these issues, learning about these topics. They're, they're, uh, they're very important. Uh, that was a wonderful presentation. I, I, I think um, as you look back at the formation of our Constitution and the Bill of Rights, one of the things that's really remarkable about it is, is that given the religious context of the time, uh, that the Constitution itself really was so secular. Um, that it, you know, the only, only real mentions of religion uh, in the Constitution are the First Amendment and then the no religious test for, for holding uh, public office. So that became the context for how religion did develop and flourish in this country. Uh, I think, as you pointed out right at the end, one of the interesting contrasts is between uh, how religion has really flourished in the United States uh, if you compare it to some of the, uh, the, the nations in Europe where there may still be officially established um, churches, those countries are, for the most part, much more secular, much less participation in religion than there is here in the United States. So in that sense, it is probably true that, um, that separation of church and state really benefited religion uh, much more than, uh, than, it, than it might have harmed it. Um, I think that's still too true today. Um, it's interesting because the debate has shifted, and you have groups um, such as some you know, branches of the of the Baptist Church um, today. You hear people who really decry uh, separation of church and state, either arguing against it or arguing that it was never meant to be because the words themselves aren't in the Constitution, just the you know the concept, um, the concept of it. And what, having served as a, a minister, albeit in a, in a fairly progressive um, faith tradition, but having served as a, um, as a minister in a congregation, one of the things I'm very well aware of is just how much freedom we give to churches and religious congregations. I mean, they're, they're free from almost all reporting requirements. You don't even have to file to be a nonprofit organization. You don't have to file annual uh, reporting statements as any other nonprofit would. Um, you have benefits of tax exemptions. But, uh, it, there, it, is a, it is about as free an institution as we have in the United States. Uh, and so sometimes when people uh, in religious communities argue against separation of church and state, one of my responses is something uh, along the lines of be careful what you ask for. You might not like what you get if you, if you get what you say that, that you want. Uh, now, a lot has changed. Um, since when the Constitution was adopted. Uh, when you think about that context, I mean, at the time, slavery was still allowed. Women still couldn't vote. Um, it was before the concept of evolution had even been introduced. There was certainly no discussion of same-sex marriage 
uh, as we're talking about today. Contraception had, methods hadn't been invented that we um, use today. Many of the things that are the substance of the debates around religious freedom um, and, and religious liberty didn't even exist, or had, the context has changed a great deal. Uh, one of the, th and, and we'll come back to some of those, you'll hear more about some of those even in, uh, from other speakers. Uh, but one of the things that has also changed is that while this is still a majority Christian nation in terms of the, the uh, claimed religious identity that people have within this country, it is a much more diverse, much more pluralistic uh, nation than it used to be. We, uh, there's a, a growing number of people in, uh, in faith traditions other than Christianity, a growing number of people who don't identify with any specific religious tradition. Uh, they're probably the biggest decline has actually been in the very mainstream Protestant uh, traditions that, that were the predominant context that, uh, you know, for, the, for the nation's religious life. Um, there's a, a greater evangelical movement and actually the, uh, the, than there used to be, although you know, even there the numbers are shifting. The Catholic Church, there's actually been a great turnover in who's in the Catholic Church, but the numbers have, have, have stayed pretty stable. Uh, but, uh, but overall, the level of diversity and pluralism in this country has been, uh, has really increased. And one of the, you know, the things that, again, is really remarkable is that out of a country that started with, uh, while well, there was religious diversity right at the, at the founding of this nation, but less than is the case today, that we have been able to evolve in a way that accommodates that religious pluralism. And certainly coming from where I'm coming, my own position um, with the uh, American Civil Liberties Union, the ACLU of Colorado, upholding our ability to maintain freedom of religion in that pluralistic world um, is a very important priority for us. Uh, now that, that means a lot of different things. Part of it is um, the, um, the establishment clause upholding that as it applies and since um, the, the 14th Amendment um, applying to the states as well as applying to the federal government uh, that, the, that it's, it should not be the role of government to support or promote a religious um, point of view or a particular religious faith. Um, that's not an anti-religious stance, and in fact, as I just said, I think religion has actually flourished under that separation of church and state. Um, but it is really being wary and careful of any place that government moves into religion. Uh, part of what makes that difficult, what makes it complicated, is that for much of the century after the Constitution was adopted, um, that overall context of the First Amendment and, um, and separation of church and state coexisted with a lot of, you know, sort of informal religious practices, whether it was using the Bible in schools or whether it was, you know, prayers in, in public settings, uh, putting in God we trust on our coins and things like the civil religion. A lot of that's the civil religion side of that. Um, but that coexisted with, uh, with what was in the, the Constitution and as developments happened, as things happened, like the notion of evolution came onto the scene and there were conflicts around religious, uh, uh, religious ideas, it became more necessary to uh, really define some of these things in the courts. There weren't a lot of court cases around this in the first century after the, the Constitution. The ACLU itself wasn't formed until uh, 1920, which is the year that, uh, that women first were able to vote. In this country, and a lot of so it's been less than a hundred years that a lot of the real case law on this um, has developed and it's really been tested. Um, I mentioned evolution be because uh, the role of religion in the schools is one of the things that has, that continues to be a big challenge today, both in terms of what is taught, you know, in the classroom, and in terms of how funding streams support education and whether. Uh, public funds can be used to support uh, religious schools, whether uh, directly or indirectly. Uh, and those continue to be part of the landscape of issues around um, church and state and religious freedom uh, today. Uh, the ACLU, one of the very first things that we got involved in, and certainly 
the first really big public thing was the Scopes trial, um, while around uh, the you know, teaching of um, whether evolution could be taught in a school in Tennessee. ACLU and its allies actually lost that, that case, but it changed the landscape on the, um, on the issue. And it ended up um, with the introduction of scientific ideas into the classroom that are today so widely accepted in the science world that now the, the issue, the debate, becomes something where it almost turns religious liberty on its head. Uh, there was a bill in the, in the last legislature right here, and it's something that's been going around the, the, the country, um, sponsored by supporters of, of creationism in the schools, that is entirely framed in terms of religious liberty, academic freedom, uh, that we should teach the controversy, so you, know, you should be able to teach creationism in the school. And it's much more complex. It's actually very challenging to get at the religious liberty issues in these, um, because the things that are the overall uh, values being claimed around religious freedom are things we, we actually very much support. But when you dig a little bit deeper, it becomes really about introducing religious ideas into a class that isn't about religion. And it's actually about trying to argue against scientific issues, uh, ideas for the purpose of promoting a religious point of view, which is very different than what the scientific ideas themselves are about. People who are teaching evolution in a biology classroom aren't there to, um, you know, to try to debunk religion or to promote or, or stop a religious point of view, if it has an effect on people's religious beliefs, that's entirely secondary. It's not the purpose of the teaching or of the class. Whereas the efforts to get creationism into the classroom are often things where the purpose of it, the very core purpose of it, is to try to promote a religious point of view. And if that's happening in a public institution, that has become to be interpreted as something that violates uh, that establishment clause in the Constitution. So it, it, these are really difficult um, issues. Uh, another example that I would give uh, to this is the, uh, the issue of prayer in schools. I mean, ACLU has often been accused of being uh, you know, anti-prayer or anti-prayer in, in schools, and that really isn't the case because it's, again, it's about Religious freedom, the, uh, the free, free exercise clause, we support just as much as the um, establishment clause. If, for example, you have a student in a classroom who uh, bows his or her head to pray and the teacher says, oh, you can't do that, you can't pray in school, we would be on the side of the student, not the teacher there. Of course you can pray. Of course you have the right to practice your religion. If, if several students wanted to get together voluntarily on their own accord and pray around the flagpole after school, they could do that. The problem comes if the school itself, if leaders and, uh, of the school and, or the official um, school structure itself is, is promoting that gathering around the flagpole or, or actually instituting the prayer and or leading the, the prayers or establishing it in the classroom, it changes the whole picture. So it's not about being pro-prayer or anti-prayer, it's being pro-First Amendment. It's being about the, the uh, pure religion, but not to have the state involved in promoting a, uh, a religious point of view of, of any particular kind. Uh, one way that that this shift in how the debate is occurring is illustrated is by uh, a, a law and a set of follow-up laws that are, are known as the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Um, in 1993, the uh, <coughs> Religious Freedom Re Restoration Act, often abbreviated as RIFRA, R-F-R-A, um, was a law that was passed. It was actually ended up um, found not, was not upheld um, constitutionally in terms of how it applied to the states, but it was upheld um, as, as federal law. And what it was trying to do was really to uh, reinstitute or re-strengthen something called um, the Sherbert test, which was about having strict scrutiny in laws where the law may be neutral, but it is it, seen as burdening the free exercise of religion. And uh, the, the particular case that it that that law 
uh, came from was one around um, Native American practices and, and uh, with someone you know, being fired for um, testing for substances that were used in these Native American ceremonies and uh, it, it found that no, you should be able to uh, follow your religious practice. There are many kinds of issues that come up around things like accommodation in the workplace. How do you accommodate people in the workplace who have different religious points of, of view or different religious traditions around uh, even things like holidays and what uh, the food that they have access to, whether they have the opportunity to pray if that is part of their you know, tradition. Accommodation in the workplace uh, is, is something that we would support because it is part of free exercise of religion. Um, so that type of, of personal religious freedom and free exercise of religion ha has been contrasted with now and I, 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 it, a whole movement that has developed and that's really the, the core debate that's going on today around a def what is the definition of religious freedom and situations where that the religious freedom is being applied, not so much, the idea of religious being, freedom is being applied not so much to um, that individual right to practice your religion, but to people who are in some position of power over others who wish to impose their religious views or practices on other people. And you see, that's a different thing. All the really difficult cases in civil liberties are where one right or freedom bumps into another one, where uh, or those, are the, those are the hard cases. And, uh, but what's being uh, claimed here, and so now there are, have been bills, and we had, uh, we've had proposals you know, here in Colorado too, where the ACLU that supported that original RIFRA law has opposed the state level RIFRA laws and it's not because the ACLU has changed its overall perspective. It's because the laws are being used differently. Instead of enhancing accommodation and personal free exercise, they've been about employers or institutions saying, well, as an employer, I don't want to have to um, accommodate my uh, you know, people. I, if I don't believe in contraception, I don't want my, uh, the insurance that we provide to cover contraception. Uh, I don't want to be able to serve people who I don't agree with um, religiously, or, or I don't support um, same-sex marriage, so I won't serve people who are gay or lesbian. Um, I, I, it, or I want to be able to teach what I believe in the classroom, regardless of whether that uh, that goes along uh, goes against the, um, the the scientific curriculum. And these are all situations where it's the person who is in the position of greater power or authority, or the one who, who is wanting to say it violates my religious freedom to have to, um, to accommodate other people, or to serve other people, or to allow something in my institution that's diff that doesn't fit with my own religious belief. And you can see how that really turns that whole notion of religious freedom on its head. But that is the debate that we have now, and, and you will hear a lot about that in current um, uh, legislative issues, in ballot initiatives, we will very likely see another one of these religious freedom um, acts again uh, on the ballot. And it's something that we won't uh, likely support as an ACLU for exactly that reason. And it's not because we don't support individual religious freedom in practice. We, we very much do. Um, it's about not allowing religion to then be used to impose religious practices on others who may not share that religion or to discriminate against other people. You know, we don't, uh, you know, back in the, uh, in, in the 60s, we really settled that um, under public accommodation law, that if you have a restaurant and, uh, and you don't want to serve African Americans, and believe me, there were religious justification that was often given for that, um, that you can't do that. If you're opening yourself to the public, you need to serve everyone. Uh, the same is true today, whether it's uh, uh, gay and lesbian individuals or whether it's people uh, you know, who have different beliefs than you do. Public accommodation has to, be, um, has to truly be public. And these are the issues that are, that are still coming up today and that you'll hear more about from, uh, from subsequent um, speakers. So the, the issues have changed over time. But the core context really has not. We still have a very religiously dynamic country. 
here, where people are free to um, believe what they wish to believe, to share and debate and talk about, as I hope you all do, uh, your religious beliefs with other, other people. Um, that religious freedom is something we really support, but it has to be something where we can all live together, uh, where all of the range of religious and non-religious views can coexist. And I actually think that the, the Constitution provided a very good context for that to occur, but it's a challenge to, um, to maintain that. And that's part of what I consider to be the goal and mission of the ACLU, is to help that to happen. So, thank you. And Thank you very much, and truly how interesting when you bring out the fact that uh, the United States has is such a society of diverse religious cultures, and uh, notwithstanding that no religious test for public office and separation of church and state. Funny how things turn out. All right, thank you very much. And up next we have State Representative Mark Ferrandino. And uh, Representative Ferrandino, I should say, Speaker of the House Ferrandino, will be speaking on religious liberty and lobbying. Uh, Mark is Speaker of the Colorado House of Representatives, and he personally re represents House District 2. Prior to joining the state legislature, he worked as a senior budget analyst for the Colorado Department of Health Care and Financing. As a House, uh, <coughs> excuse me, as a representative in the House of Representatives, Ferrandino has introduced legislation to reform mortgage lending and fiscal practices and to legalize civil unions and to expand employment benefits for same-sex partners of state employees. In addition to his service in the legislature, uh, Speaker Ferrandino has assumed leadership uh, positions in the Colorado Democratic Party and in the national and state Stonewall Democrats. Speaker of the House, Mark Ferrandino. Thank you, Danny. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, uh, and thank you for allowing me to come and speak on this issue. You know, I think we heard some great talks about the history and what's going on in religious freedom and uh, the First Amendment in our uh, in our country. And you know, I get each day as Speaker of the House to kind of live it, and it's one of those things that. You know, we don't think about it a lot when we're down at the Capitol, but it creeps up a lot about how, where religion intersects with what we do as legislators. Uh, and it comes in from the smallest things to huge debates on issues. And so let me give you a small example of where this uh, separation uh, has come up. When I took over for this uh, speakership, the tradition for, uh, since anyone can remember, was that we do a morning prayer every morning before the legislature starts. And we do it before we gavel in the session. And the reason, argument for that was to say that we would not, uh, until we were doing our official business, we could actually get together and pray. And if you didn't want to, you didn't have to be there, but we would have a morning prayer. We have various different denominations and different religions come in and speak. And the speaker before me actually changed that practice and said, no, we're going to gavel in and then we're going to do the prayer. And there was no decision. The speaker gets to make the decision without any say from the rest of the General Assembly. And so when I took over, a lot of members came up to me and said, this is a huge problem. We don't like this. Uh, and then I looked at the history and the tradition and changed it back to the way it had been. And, you know, I think a lot of our members felt it was important to be outside of the official business of the legislature. And so we continue to do the morning prayer each morning, um, but it now is back to where it was before we saw the change this last year. You know, and so that's one little example. But also, uh, every, every legislator, there's 100 legislators, 65 in the House, 35 in the Senate, we all come with some type of either religious, moral, um, secular beliefs. And we don't leave that when we come into the chamber uh, outside. We don't, you know, we, all the decisions we make are based on what we believe is right. Uh, and that comes from our moral history. A lot of our moral, our moral beliefs, a lot of our moral beliefs come from our religion. So it's not something we can easily separate. 
But when it comes to practice, you heard a couple examples, and I want to just touch on one or two. Um, this year alone, I carried the bill on civil unions, and that became law. And there was a huge debate in the legislature on civil unions, and this year was around religious freedom. And the issue around civil unions this year was around adoption agencies. And should Catholic charities, charities and other religious institutions be able to deny LGBT couples their services? And many people came into the legislature and argued that it is, it is important that this, these entities have their religious freedom so not to provide services to LGBT couples because that was against their religious beliefs. Uh, and it's this entire movement, as you just heard, around religious freedom, being able to exercise your religious freedom outside of what I would say is your, your own belief and relationship with God and outside your own church or synagogue. Uh, and so we actually didn't uh, support that and weren't going to allow that to move forward. So the bill now actually says um, if you are a Catholic charity, you still have to adopt to LGBT couples. And that's been the practice in most states around this country. And we, during the debate, we had a lot of people who came and talked about religious issues. And either the adoption agency issues or just generally. We had a lot of people in the legislature come and bring their copy of whatever religious document they think is important and quote from it to say why civil unions were bad and why we shouldn't pass them. And each member who sits in the committees and sits on the floor of the House brings their own, as I said, religious beliefs. And it is something we use, I think, to inform our decisions. But one of the things I always stress, and I said during the debate on this, is you know, our job is to make laws for everyone in our state. Uh, it is not to make it for one specific religion or another specific religion, but try and make sure that everyone has equal access to the laws. And just because you have one religious belief or another religious belief, that doesn't mean that should be the law of the land. And it is where we try and make sure that everyone has access and that we are not trying to establish or take uh, either the Bible, the Quran, uh, the Torah, any religious document and put that into our laws. And that all of those documents affect and influence our laws. It's just it's not what we use to make sure that as we look at the laws, that's what we are uh, deciding. And so, you know, when we debated and we had this issue on the civil unions, we were able to pass it because we felt that it was giving everyone equal access to the laws. And even though there was a lot of people on one side of religion uh, who were saying that this was the wrong thing, I will also say there were a lot of people on the, in the religious community also actively supporting the legislation. You know, it's one of the things we hear a lot, and some of actually members of my own party sometimes say religion should be outside of the legislature. And I actually highly disagree with that. Uh, religion should be very much in what we do and what we, how we have the arguments. And if you look at some of the biggest changes in our history, especially with the civil rights movement, it was the churches who really were the ones who helped move the ball forward. And so it is important for religion to be part of the discussion, to be part of how we make the decisions, but not the controlling factor in how we make decisions, especially not one religion over another religion, and making sure that no religion or no individual has the right to impose their religious beliefs on someone else. Um, and I will touch quickly on the religious freedom issues, because it, I think, is an important issue that will probably come up. Uh, it came up last legislative session, started talking about it. It's probably going to come up next legislative session. It will continue to come up in our uh, debate, both in the Capitol and, I think, possibly in the ballot box, uh, either this November or next November or in subsequent years. And it really is this issue of, should we allow individuals who have religious beliefs to then say to others, I can dictate what you do because I have some power over you. And I, if, I, if you don't let me do that, I will not have the religious freedoms. That's the argument. And it really is, in my opinion, something that will roll us back in terms of religious freedom because it is one where someone can, I think, impose their beliefs on someone else. And to me, the, the, our First Amendment, what government's role is, is to make sure that is not happening. 
to make sure that everyone has the ability to exercise their own religion, but not to impose it on others. And we see it all the time in the legislature. And with this movement, it's going to continue to happen. Uh, and we need to be really careful. Uh, you know, it's always because, I think the Reverend said, you have to be careful what you wish for. Uh, because some days you always get, some days you can get what you want, and if other days you lose and someone gets what they want. If you don't like it, um, it is one of those things that's hard to reverse. And so you have to always be careful as you change things and as you move things forward uh, through legislation. Because it's not an easy thing uh, to move things through the legislature. But you want to be really thoughtful on how religion intersects with the government. Uh, and it's interesting in the history, I didn't know all the history, and uh, understand the issue of the, you know, the civil church and trying to separate the establishment of religion from the government. And I think that's a very important thing when we look at how we function today. Religion is a vibrant part of our society. It should be a vibrant part of our society. It should help inform what we do in the legislature and in government. It just shouldn't be the controlling thing that informs everything. It should be part of the infrastructure, not the controlling thing. And so it is one of those battles we continue to have we hear every day at the Capitol. Um, we're going to continue to do that no matter what, you know, for I think for the next couple centuries at least, as long as our country's around, we're going to continue to fight over what role religion has in government. Uh, it should have an important role. Um, and so, you know, it is really important to understand how the history of this, how we move forward um, with this, and also understand that as we see pressures and other things go through the legislature and through the ballot box, that we're mindful of how religion plays in society and how that impacts all of our freedoms. Um, so, you know, I think it's important you guys are here understanding this history, understanding what's going on, uh, because a, an informed electorate makes better decisions for our entire country. So, thank you guys for having me here. I'm looking forward to doing Q and A a little later. Thank you very much, Speaker Ferrandino. And our last speaker before we get to that question and answer period is Denise Mays. And Denise will be speaking on religious freedom or the right to discriminate. Denise is the public policy director at the ACLU of Colorado, where she monitors bills, testifies uh, before state legislators, including Mark Ferrandino, and works in coalitions at the legislative and local levels to protect civil liberties. Now, previously, Denise was the director of administration for Vice President Joe Biden. Uh, Denise is a native of New Mexico, but has called Denver home for 23 years. Denise Mayes, come on up. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so, the, um, the real downside of being the last speaker is that, um, one, everybody has really basically said what I was going to say. Uh, <laughs> And secondly, um, they've said it very well. So um, I'm not sure that I can really add very much. Um, I want to thank um, all four of the speakers for, uh, or all three, I should say, and, and, and Danny, of course, of um, you know putting the subject, I think, in good context. And I think you have seen a very clear theme of what we're all talking about. And, and honestly, uh, the title of my topic being uh, religious freedom, or is it the right to discriminate, I think articulates the issue fairly well, at least from the ACLU perspective. A couple of things that are going on right now nationwide that I think really focus on um, these particular, on this topic or these particular issues really front and center. And um, uh, I'm going to talk about a couple of them, or at least um, touch upon them, and, and um, and they might uh, be a good uh, area to have some discussion and debate, perhaps, in the, in the question and answer period. I, I will say, as a disclaimer, that even though I am a lawyer and that I have a JD, I don't practice law as a public policy director, so there might be a lot of the nuances of the law that I'm not entirely clear about, but I'll certainly be um, happy to try to answer your questions in any way that I can. As many of you may know, um, as part of the Affordable Care Act, the federal government issued a rule that requires health plans to cover contraception without copay. 
This particular rule um, that was adopted by Health and Human Services for purposes of enacting the Affordable Care Act has been the subject of a lot of challenge. It's been the subject of challenge from both um, uh, non-profit religious entities or just non-profit groups in general, and it's also been the subject of a challenge by for-profit corporations or for-profit companies. And the reason why I raise the distinction between those two entities is because the law will likely, we think, or the, the case law so far has treated those entities differently. Um, as a result, and you may recall that there was a lot of outcry by religious institutions, the Catholic Church primarily, about this Affordable Care Act rule. And basically they were saying, for us to have a, a contraceptive coverage in our insurance plans violates our religious belief against contraceptions, and so therefore we want an exemption from this particular rule. And sure enough, um, Health and Human Services did come up with an exemption um, in June of this year that basically says that um, it wanted to ensure that employees will still receive contraception coverage, but that the nonprofit employer with seriously and closely held religious objections would not bear the cost or otherwise have any connection with the coverage. Now, once that rule was enacted, um, I think a lot of us pretty much thought that that would pretty much put to rest those particular claims from those particular groups. It is not. Um, what they continue to argue in the courts, and there are a variety of, of federal district court cases that have addressed this, is they still claim that just the fact that there is the potential for contraceptive coverage by their employees in and of itself is a violation of their um, religious freedom and therefore their religious objections. Um, the rule, however, regardless of how it applies to um, nonprofit religious entities, it has not been um, tailored to for-profit entities. So in essence, there is no exemption at all for for-profit entities. They are still required under the Affordable Care Act and under the Health and Human Services rule to provide contraceptive coverage without having to bear the cost of it. So the federal government will bear that cost. Well, that of course is not uh, put to rest any, um, any claims. There have been quite a few court cases and there's one that's in particular that um, would affect the state of Colorado or would affect this region and it's, it's a case that was brought by Hobby Lobby. And Hobby Lobby is a for-profit company. I think uh, it's fairly widely known that they are a closely held corporation uh, by individuals of the Mormon faith. And they have filed a lawsuit. They filed in the federal district court um, in Oklahoma. And um, the, the federal district court essentially dismissed their claim. They appealed it to the 10th Circuit Court of Appeals in the Colorado. state of Colorado is in the 10th Circuit, which is why I, it, it's one that we might have heard more about or, or have more um, information about. But basically, the 10th Circuit reversed the federal district court. And the 10th Circuit did conclude uh, it was a preliminary injunction um, uh, hearing, so it's a, it's a little complicated to explain what will ultimately happen at the end of the case. But what the Tenth Circuit held is that there is a, uh, uh, that Hobby Lobby is likely to win on the merits that the Affordable Care Act rule will infringe on their religious views and is therefore unconstitutional. Um, there are a series of cases all over the country. Some cases have come uh, have come on fa in favor of the of the company, and others have come in favor of um, the Health and Human Services Secretary, who's the name defendant in all these cases, saying that this is not a violation of religious freedom. The cases will undoubtedly lead ultimately to a Supreme Court decision. Some um, uh, Supreme Court watchers and other scholars think that that might even be a case that will come up in the next term. And that has a lot of very serious implications, as I'm sure you can see. Um, what I thought I would do just very briefly is uh, kind of outline what some of the arguments are, what claims that the plaintiffs have made, and these are the ones that were made in the Hobby Lobby case, and they're pretty much the same ones that you'll see in all of the cases. But essentially they argue this particular affordable care mandate constitutes a government-imposed pressure and coercion on the plaintiffs to change or violate their religious beliefs. They claim that they, the plaintiffs, have a sincere, closely held religious objection to providing coverage for contraception, 
since they believe that those drugs could prevent a human embryo from implanting in the wall of the uterus, causing death to the embryo. Plaintiffs consider the prevention of this um, uh, uh, <coughs> implantation uh, is, uh, is the equivalent of an abortion and is therefore um, against their religious views. They further argue that this forces the plaintiffs to choose between violating their religious beliefs or terminating employee health coverage. And another part of the Affordable Care Act rule is if you don't provide this coverage, you are subject to um, fees that are imposed on a daily basis. So basically Hobby Lobby is saying here, we either acquiesce and we, um, we forego our religious views or we hang on to our religious views and not give health coverage and subject ourselves to essentially what could be millions of dollars in fines and penalties. ACLU filed a brief in that case um, challenging um, Hobby Lobby's position and these were in some the arguments that we um, articulated in our brief and, and they're no different than really what a lot of our speakers have already talked to but we, we try to make the argument um, that the distinction between a for-profit and a non-profit is actually of real significance. You know, for-profits are held by large numbers of shareholders, the religious views of all of them could be different, and so there really is no complete nexus between um, the corporation and its religiously held beliefs. And so what we argued is that the connection is simply too tenuous that you have founders who claim to be of the Mormon faith, that is separate and apart from the corporation itself or the company, um, and therefore we're really not asking, we being the federal government, we're really not asking for you to endorse contraceptive use. And it's even more tenuous when you're not the be, you're not even having the relationship with your employer, right? I mean, your employee. It is the employee that makes that choice, and then um, it, you know your insurance company, in some big broad way, pays for it. So the arguments primarily were that they are extremely tenuous. Um, and that it is an employee's independent decision to use contraception or not, and that is the employee's religious or personal choice that shouldn't be infringed upon by any religious views. So those are basically the arguments that, that we made, and they kind of summarize, I think, what, what all of the speakers, and um, Nathan in particular, was talking about, uh, how some of these arguments are, you know, they kind of turn each other's on the head, and they get a little bit confusing. Um, the cases that are challenging the contraceptive rule are only one set of cases in which institutions and individuals are seeking exemption from anti-discrimination rules on the basis that they violate their religious beliefs. Um, Speaker Ferrandino referenced the civil unions provision and, and the ACLU of course was arguing very um, wholeheartedly against that exemption for I think the reasons that the speaker articulated but, but primarily we could see why a state law that was actually providing civil liberties would have a provision within it that would exempt an entire class of individuals and deny them of particular civil rights. Um, and so um, that is one example. Uh, another uh, case that the ACLU has been involved in, and it's here in the metro area, there is a cake shop, um, and a cake shop owner who refused to bake a cake for a civil union ceremony on the basis that they did not believe in civil unions as a religious um, uh, faith or a religious belief. The ACLU challenged that um, action on the part of the cake shop owner on the basis that it violated the public accommodations law in Colorado. The public accommodations law says you can't deny services to the public on the basis of race, gender, uh, national origin, uh, religious beliefs, and um, sexual orientation is in our public accommodations law. Um, so far, the, the Civil Rights Division heard our argument and they ruled in the favor of the couple. Um, but that case is still in the process of being litigated um, and they are claiming uh, the, uh, the cake shop owner continues to claim that their religious beliefs or their religious views allow them to basically turn away individuals such as this particular civil union couple that referenced. There have been similar cases like this, one in New Mexico that involved a photographer, a photography company 
that didn't want to provide uh, photography services to a civil union. Um, so all of these cases that have been around uh, the country based on these sort of public services have been in the context of, of civil unions, but they obviously, you can see that they could be um, they could be articulated in a number of other scenarios and other fact patterns. Um, I think that uh, both um, Nathan and the speaker touched on what other things might be happening. One, for example, is is there there was a, a ballot title and language that was filed in the last election in 2012 that basically wanted to codify uh, this argument that it is okay to, to discriminate or deny services on the basis of a religious, of a closely held religious belief. That did not make it on the ballot, although we, we seriously think that these folks are serious themselves and they'll probably make another attempt uh, in, in 2014. Um, as Nathan mentioned there have been um, state legislative efforts um, to, to try to codify in some way uh, what they term as religious liberty and as we refer to as essentially the giving them the right to discriminate. And that basically um, summarizes, I think, what the ACLU position has always been and, and that it's basically using religion to discriminate, which we find to be uh, particularly offensive to be able to use religion in that way since the ACLU, as Nathan mentioned, has always protected the individual rights to freedom of religion. Um, so we talk about it in terms of being about discrimination, plain and simple. Um, there are instances, for example, that if you were to work at a public establishment or an institution that serves the public, um, our view is that you cannot refuse to hire or serve people because of their age, because of their gender, because of their race, religion, or sexual orientation. It's the whole notion that if you're open to the public, you ought to serve your public and you take it as it comes. People have the right to their religious beliefs, but this does not give them the right to discriminate. So it's obviously the same theme. We, um, there, if you have laws like this, it creates the possibility that institutions like hospitals and universities that employ and serve people of many faiths and provide health, education, and social services should play by the public rules. And um, this is particularly true, I think, in institutions that receive public funding, which could be hospitals, uh, universities, um, other institutions. Um, religious freedom in America means that every person has the right to his or her own uh, re personal religious beliefs, but it's not a free pass. It's not a free pass that people and institutions can use whenever they want to discriminate against others, and it does not mean that religious institutions are exempt from following the laws. Um, that pretty much is the, the summary of what's out there. It's the summary of the ACLU uh, position and the stance. It's discrimination, plain and simple, and um, that's it. Thank you very much.